right, we're live. Sorry, I'm a couple minutes late to get started here, but um, had to get organized, had to get my coffee. Um, cool. I am excited about today uh, because we're going to be starting the next uh, project, which is going to be um, implementing or simulating, I should say, we can't implement one, but simulating a quantum computer in Rust. Um, so I've been uh, interested in quantum mechanics for a long time, um, have, have studied it pretty extensively. Um, well, pretty extensively is probably too strong a word. I've studied it uh, to some extent uh, mathematically, and one of the things I think that's always a, a little bit of a struggle in um, quantum mechanics is the, the concepts that are taught um, are easy to understand. It's, it's easy, at least if you've got a math background, it's easy to look at it, uh, study it, and say, okay, I can see the math working here. I could see how this would, would work out. Um, but, but to come away with it from it without a whole lot of kind of intuition as to how it works. Um, and so I've had this suspicion that, um, if we, if I instead, uh, learned a little bit about quantum computing, where the systems are simpler, um, it would potentially be a nice way to build up more sort of quantum intuition. Um, and this is pretty analogous to like, I guess my experience with learning, you know, how to, how to program in the first place, um, where you look around the world and there is a lot of complexity and there's a lot of strange things going on. Um, and when you learn how to program and you learn how to sort of turn those strange, complex things, you know, politics and uh, economics and science and math into programs, it, it really helps elucidate and give you kind of a, a, a nice framework for, um, for, for thinking about those things and, and developing intuition about them. Uh, and so I'm kind of hoping that, that doing, doing the same thing with quantum computing um, will serve as that good intuition pump for quantum mechanics. Also, it's a really nice application for a whole bunch of concepts in math that I think are uh, like a little hard to necessarily motivate otherwise, but end up being really useful. Um, so we've got complex numbers, which we already talked about a little bit last time. We've got uh, matrices um, and tensor multiplication and like all sorts of good stuff, good linear algebra stuff that's that's very concrete. Um, and also, I had one other thing, probabilities, of course. Um, oh, Fourier, uh, Fourier transforms. So uh, the thing I want to kind of build up to um, with this is uh, getting to implement Shor's algorithm, uh, which is um, the kind of the, I don't know, pinnacle, at least my understanding of it, is that it's the uh, kind of pinnacle um, or the canonical uh, quantum algorithm, which lets you find um, the prime factors of a number. Um, and, oops, that was meant to be showing my screen there. Um, so it's a quantum algorithm that lets you find the prime factors of an integer, um, and this would be really important if we could do it effectively, um, because among other, well, it helps you solve a lot of problems, and also it has implementation. It has implications for um, for security issues, where uh, some encryption algorithms use the fact that we can't factor prime numbers quickly as a key um, component, as like the the lock, so to speak, to keep you from uncovering passwords and, and such. So I think it's RSA is the the big one that that does that. Um, and so there's quite a good Wikipedia article on how Shor's algorithm works. Um, it gets a little fuzzy in the quantum part. Um, so, uh, but I, I think we'll, I think we'll be able to figure it out. Um, so I would say this is, this is going to be a series where we go through a lot of, uh, topics that I'm like pretty familiar with already. And, um, and I'm excited to, to, kind of demo those and teach them and show them. And then we're going to get into some of the deeper um, quantum computing stuff. Uh, and there's going to be 
um, some some trickiness there, and I'm going to be learning uh, at the same time as uh, as doing. So that's you know I, part of the reason that I'm doing this is because I love to to learn, and I find it really effective to try to program something in order to learn it, um, and try to teach something in order to learn it, for that matter. Uh, so I'm I'm excited to kind of go from my like broad understanding of Shorey's algorithm to a much more tactical one would be one of the one of the main goals um the other kind of source that i've been using as i've been uh preparing for and, and thinking about this is this book Intro introductory quantum algorithms or sorry introduction to quantum computing um it's free online from these uh three people um philip k raymond laflamme and michelle mosca um it is up on if you google it you will find it for free as a pdf um and i, I think it's like quite a good book I'm, I'm surprised it's online for free um but i was i was excited to to see that it is um and so i think in particular today i want to um to see if we can get to uh interference um where we essentially will will implement uh these two really simple quantum circuits um, and show that they behave differently, um, and, and show that there's quantum interference from, from measuring in the, in the middle. So we'll see if we can get there. Um, I have a little over two hours today. Um, so yeah, I might not, but, um, that's what we'll aim for. Um, cool, cool. All right. So let me actually pour my coffee before we get started. Give folks a little bit of time to filter in. Um, oh, and the other thing, um, just to close out from last time, we were looking at this um, Colatz Euler problem, and and right at the end, uh, we were super close to solving it, and we hit a um, we hit a um, attempt to multiply with overflow which surprised me because we were starting at a million um, and calculating the Colat sequences, or we were going up to a million calculating the Colat sequences. Um, so it surprised me. I mean, four billion is is roughly what, um, what a U32 holds, and that's what we were using. Um, but I took a look at what was just the call stack, um, and it goes like 60-ish deep which means in some of these line 26, I think is dividing by two and, and line 28 is three and plus one. Uh, so some of these are dividing by two, um, but this is something like three to the, I don't know, 40, 30, uh, which is well over a thousand. Um, and so, uh, you know, well over 4,000. So 4,000 times, times a million would be enough to overflow or 5,000 times a million would be enough to overflow. Um, and so I thought, oh, okay, maybe we are just overflowing U32s. Um, and indeed, I just literally find replaced all of the U32s with U64s and it ran correctly. So this is not the right one. Um, so let's update our test and let's, um, da, 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 and let's enter our answer. And it likes it. So we got the right answer. We were, we were so close last time. Um, but I had to had to run at the last minute. Uh, we were one one tiny little bug off, but we got there. So, um, all right, and let's just go ahead and commit that, and then get these U sixty fours for O fourteen. So, on to the new repo, the quantum computing repo. 
Um, and let me just make sure. Ooh, I need to close the old repo. It is not showing up. I'm glad I checked that. Okay, here we go. All right. So quantum computing simulator. So obviously we will not be implementing a quantum computer because quantum computers need quantum stuff. Um, it's really, really hard to implement a quantum computer in the world. You have to find like the quantum analog of transistors um, that are capable of implementing basic quantum behaviors. Um, and then you can turn them into a quantum circuit, which can then implement an arbitrary quantum computer, um, which is super cool, but it's also super hard. I think, I, I, I know recently there have been a bunch of advances in quantum computing. Um, so this has probably changed. I know like Google, I think has a quantum, has built a quantum computer and Microsoft, I don't know, all the, the big tech companies are starting to actually invest in it, which is super cool and part of my motivation here. Um, but the last time I looked into it, I think uh, somebody had on a real quantum computer implemented Shor's algorithm for factoring uh, uh, large numbers um, and had factorized 15. Uh, it, so they had used a quantum computer to prove that 15 is three times five. Um, which is a small number, um, but a huge achievement, apparently. So it's really hard. Um, we will obviously not be doing that. What we will be doing is using a classical computer to simulate a quantum computer. Um, and, and the goal really is to understand how the quantum computer works or how to model the quantum computer, I should say, because obviously we're not going to simulate, you know, the spin of an electron or something. Um, we want to understand the, um, the, the mechanics or, uh, how we should think about how we can model quantum phenomena in a quantum computer or even real phenomena in a quantum computer. Um, and so I, I went ahead and brought in a couple of, um, uh, helper libraries, uh, or help, helper crates that I think we'll need. Um, one is N algebra, which is the like linear algebra uh, crate in Rust that we'll be using because we'll be doing lots of things with matrices. Um, another is RAND, which is random number generator. Um, and uh, I think I mentioned this last time when I was writing some tests about uh, complex numbers, uh, Rust doesn't have a approximately equal um, assertion, which is kind of tedious when you're testing um, floats a lot. And so this float, uh, float compare or float CMP crate has, um, has nice macros for that, that I figured we could take advantage of. Um, so pulled those in and I'm not going to go crazy in the readme. I'm just going to give a brief, um, outline of the plan. Um, say goals. Um, so goals and we can, um, Markdown preview, in case that helps people. Um, uh, implement a quantum computing simulator in order to help us understand quantum mechanics, quantum phenomena. Better. That's my goal. Um, that's that's really the, the, the broadest goal that I have, um, but in particular, like tactically, what do I want to do? I want to um, simulate Shor's algorithm for factoring numbers. Um, and, and we get to do some fun number theory also in here. It turns out that Shor's algorithm is like mostly a classical algorithm and then there's just a small quantum circuit in the middle of it. Um, so that's going to be, um, that's going to be interesting. Um, one other goal I have that I haven't really thought through how I want to do yet is visualize quantum circuits um, to help explain what's going on. Um, I want to do that. I don't know how yet. I'll think about it. Maybe I'll do something in Betty like I did with four dimensional Pong. I'm not sure. Um, okay, so, and today, um, t 
today the goal is going to be um, uh, to get qubit implemented. It's the quantum analog of a bit. Um, we want to get quantum gate implemented. We want to <clears throat> test an algebra functionality to ensure it will work with our needs. And that's going to be matrices and complex numbers. Um, and then we want to um, implement or demonstrate interference effects. Okay. Um, using Hadamard gates. Hadamard, Hadamard, that's Hadamard gates. Okay, we will understand what all that means. Um, hopefully by the end of today. Maybe not. It seems ambitious now that I'm thinking about it, but we'll try. Okay. So, where to start? Um, well, let's start from the beginning, which is what is a quantum computer? It's a um, computer, so it's a uh, it, it, it is a thing that can do some operations. Um, so just like a classical computer does and an or and not, a quantum computer does can do and an or and not um, as well. It can also do other ones, but instead of operating on bits, uh, which is zeros and ones, it operates on qubits, which you can think of as a superposition um, between zero and one. So it can take, it can not only be zero or one uh, with 100% probability, it can also be halfway between. Um, so it can, it can be in a state where, uh, where if you measure it, you will get zero half the time and one half the time, or zero 80% of the time and one 20% of the time. But that's actually not enough information. That's actually not the core thing that a qubit is. Um, so it would not be enough, for instance, to implement a qubit as uh, a random number, like a coin, right? Uh, a coin that says one, a weighted coin that says one if it comes up heads and zero if it comes up tails. Right? Every, what, I, what I just described was a system where you could completely describe a qubit by saying, 80% of the time it comes up one, and 0% of the time it comes up, or sorry, and 20% of the time it comes up zero. That's not enough. Qubits are a little more complicated than that. And the, the, the reason they're a little more complicated than that, <coughs> excuse me, is that they can interfere with one another. Um, so they have a little more information packed into them, which is sort of, which captures uh, the extent to which they can interfere with one another. And in fact, this is modeled by complex numbers. Um, so the, uh, the qubit will be, um, we should probably just do it. It'll be easier to, to see from some examples. Uh, but basically the qubit is going to point, it's going to be a vector of two complex numbers such that when you compute the probabilities of them, they wind up, the, the two complex numbers give you a vector on the unit sphere in, in, in that space. So uh, sort of forget I just said that, but um, wanted, to, wanted to say that because I wanted to say true things, um, but we're gonna, we're gonna go and do an example right now or in a moment. So one, once we have qubits, then we can have logic gates that operate on those qubits, just like AND and OR. These gates are totally, well, they're analogous, but there are additional ones that are important. 
Um, and then from those quantum gates, you can build circuits out of them. The circuits can do things. One of the things that they can do, if you're clever about it, is factor prime numbers efficiently. Um, and so that's, that's what we're going to eventually get to. Um, but let's start by... Um, let's start by implementing qubits. And in order to do that, we're gonna need complex numbers and we're gonna need matrices. So let's start there. Um, and I'm gonna not do what I've done in my last few repos because it's felt a little redundant. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and um, not have submodules and just keep everything in the same source folder. Um, I'll keep it and test um, um, qubit do, do, do. and we will say qubit initializes actually uh, even before we do that we should test some variant well let's 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 start there um, Qubit initializes is fine. Let's start. Let's start there. Um, okay, so what is a qubit? A qubit is a A superposition of a zero and a one and it can be modeled as a vector of um, of two complex numbers and I think that's what how I want it to look um, so we can have um, qubit, and we're going to call this basis um, zero is going to be the same thing as uh, one zero. I'll, I'll explain what this means in a in a moment. Um, Basis one is going to be zero, one. And let's make these, let's say from vector. Um, and I think we're going to want, want these to be um, actual vectors. Um, so the qubit, one qubit, is a superposition between zero and one. It's analogous to a bit, right? A bit is either zero or one. This is zero, one, or a superposition of the two. Um, the representation of the qubit is going to be something like um, qubit is... 1 over square root of 2 times the 0 state, the pure 0 state, and the pure 1 state. So this, this is halfway between, because what's going to end up happening is, um, is that we're gonna, we square stuff to get probabilities. And so this state will get measured when you measure it, 50% of the time it'll be zero with probability one over root two squared, which is one half. And 50% of the time it'll be one with probability one over root two half. It's just the way the math works out. Um, don't worry about it too much. It's called the Born rule, if you wanna look it up. Um, maybe I should be putting these into the readme. Um, concepts. Qubits. Um, example qubit state. Uh, 
Um, if measured born rule means that probability of measuring zero is one over two and probability of measuring one is one over two. Um, the spending time formatting, I shouldn't be. It'd be cool to get latex in here, latex. LaTeX, 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 I don't know how to pronounce that, um, in here so that I can actually write math, but I'm not gonna do that right now. Um, this is the Born rule. And so, um, in general, the state is gonna look like some factor times, um, what to say here? Maybe the way to do it is to say alpha times um, the zero state plus beta times the one state, where alpha squared plus beta squared is one. Um, and, and these are gonna be complex numbers. So here I happen to pick a real number, but I could have picked a different, uh, a, a complex number here. So for instance, this could be i over root two. Doesn't matter. Uh, what does matter is that when I square them um, and sum them up, I get I get one. Um, and that um, the fact that these can be complex numbers is what's going to allow interference to to take place. Um, so. Um, so basically the, the global phase doesn't matter. So if I put an I in front of all of this, all I've done is rotate, if you remember what we talked about yesterday, I've rotated by, by 45 degrees. Um, that's what I does, it rotates by 45 degrees in the complex plane. And as long as I do that everywhere, um, then it's a completely symmetric system. But if I if I take multiple things and I rotate some of them and don't rotate other ones, they'll be in phase or out of phase with one another, and that will mean they interfere differently with one another. And that's how you get um, uh, constructive and destructive interference. It's how you get entanglement. It's how you get a lot of the um, sort of buzzwords that we've heard about about quantum mechanics. Okay. Let that settle in a little bit. So, and this notation, by the way, I'm not like in love with, but it's what everybody uses. It's called Dirac notation. I just read it as state of. So the this this is just the state of zero, of being in zero, or pure state of, if you want, the pure state of being in zero, the pure state of being in one. Um, okay, <clears throat> so that's the idea. Oh, and the other thing to say there is, so we can put alpha, beta in a vector and call that the state of our qubit. qubit. So, alpha, beta, transpose, um, it, where alpha, beta, uh, let's see here, alpha, beta, transpose <coughs> on the unit sphere. Um, so where alpha squared plus beta squared equals one just means we're on the unit sphere um, is an arbitrary state. And so this is how we want to model it. We want to have a vector column vector, that's what transpose means. I'm taking this row vector because I can't do column vectors easily here. I'm taking the row vector and transposing it makes it go and, uh, you know, become a column vector. Um, so we want to model our qubits this way. So we want to be able to instantiate them from two dimensional vectors. Um, and All 
already there's an interesting question here and the, the other way i want to be able to instantiate things is just as, as a as a basis um or sorry i should say um instantiating things as a basis state uh where the basis states are just is it zero or is it one pure those are the two basis states everything is a mix of those two states um I think I want these to just be static functions though. So let's call it B. Let's see here, basis zero and basis one, something like that. Feels a little clunky, but excuse me. Um, and then the other thing I'm thinking about here is so the vec2 is always going to be a, a vector, but it's not always going to be a unit vector. Um, also, these are complex numbers. So, so I think it's fine to do from vector and have it silently um, so we, we do one of two things, right? We could um, we could error if you don't give the unit vector, or we could just normalize the vector ourselves. I think normalizing the vector ourselves is, is fine. That's going to be convenient, um, and it's hard to introduce bugs by doing that. Uh, so that's OK. Now, we do need these to be um, understood to be complex numbers. And for that, we want to make sure that we the VEC2 supports complex numbers. Um, and I, I think I want to use an algebra's uh, version of VEC. So I'm going to create a new file here that we're just going to call an algebra tests. Um, let's close the readme. And. Um, here I want to do instantiates complex vector and um, oops, wrong language. Use an algebra uh, vec. I just say prelude vec two vector two. Ooh, did I see unit vector two? I did. Oh, very nice. Okay. Can I use a unit vector in here? Um, I need a complex unit vector. Let's see here. Interesting. But I want this to be a vector of complex uh, new I wonder what I would like to do even more than that is to say 1.0 1.0 um and if i just say that this is going to have be of complex numbers does it automatically interpret this right uh do i not know
this seems like it's just as clunky as specifying it the other way. So uh, we'll just do it as complex um, from. command. Let's do that quickly. Um, cool, cool. Okay, so we got ourselves a unit vector. Uh, let's just make sure we're right about this. So the real and the imaginary components and I assume this is um, this. No. How do I get from a vector? should work. No rules expected that token. Is something wrong with this assert approx equal? this because we're inside this assertion. What happens if I cargo build? Current build's fine. Okay. Okay, and then it yells. No rules expected this token. Um, I must be doing something wrong with the macro crate uh, float CMP. Prox 
EQ. Do I have to say assert the proxy EQ? three arguments found zero. Okay, well, this is not working well. I'm pretty sure I've used this before, but let's just do it the old fashioned way. Um, v dot x dot real minus Square root of two should uh, dot abs should be less than that, and we will just assert. Could not tell you why. Um, and then we'll need imaginary, we'll need imaginary, we'll need the second coordinate. Okay, and we got failure. See, this is the annoying thing. Um, Oh, it should be one over the square root of two, yeah. Um, okay, and right, and the imaginary is just component because I gave it it's I gave it one comma one right so this is a vector of complex numbers so one comma one is has a real component that needs to be normalized to square root of two okay so that works um, cool so we want to do something similar in here, um, we'll make this unit vector two, and we will uh, and these need to be complex numbers, so this will be. goes and we'll say use an algebra unit vector 2 complex and vector 2 okay uh, this is new is vector two dot new. 
I'm trying to use complex dot one. Um, let's find out what complex can do. Um, where's the tree? Let's go perhaps. Yeah, okay. We need num traits identity is one. Is that what we need? Yeah. Okay. Num traits identity is one. Import non traits. Non traits rust. Okay. Let's see if it likes us. Okay, so we're implementing, oh, well, it's not gonna like us because we haven't done anything with qubits yet. Um, once again, do not really know why my computer is struggling, but okay. yelling at me about qubits, which is totally fine. Okay, so we want to be able to take a single qubit and give it a basis. Or and, and check on its basis vector. And the basis vector is just the the state of that qubit such that when you measure it you always get zero, which is to say the first coordinate of the vector is the complex number one, the second coordinate is zero, and vice versa. Um, now, we are going to have multiple qubits, um, and we're going to want to represent them in one matrix, so, or in one vector. Um, for multiple qubits, we have multiple vectors, but it's convenient to put them in one big vector and apply it. So for instance, um, if we want an AND gate, for instance, that should take one zero one zero two is that what I want to say? That's not a good example. Um, there's something called a controlled not gate that we're gonna use, which is where it takes two qubits as the input. The first qubit controls whether or not the second qubit gets knotted. So for instance, one so zero zero the state zero, zero, zero in the first qubit, zero in the second state, um, is going to map to zero, zero. Um, 
because the first qubit is zero, so it doesn't it doesn't not. Same thing with zero one. The first qubit is zero, so it doesn't not. One zero though is gonna get mapped to one one. And one one is gonna get mapped to one zero. And it's convenient to represent convenient to or um, we we can represent this as a four by four matrix operating on a four component vector. Okay. Um, and eg, um, you know, one zero is uh, zero one one zero transpose because this is the vector that corresponds to the state one and this is the vector that corresponds to the state zero and then the matrix is something full of ones and zeros that does the, the thing that you expect um the interesting thing from an implementation standpoint is we've got static vector sizes in here so one qubit is definitely always a unit vector but we're gonna have multiple qubits. And we're gonna wanna do some stuff with them. I think it's okay though. I wanna, I wanna optimize for um, understandability and like good primitives rather than speed or even necessarily ergonomics um i'm certainly not trying to get something performant here i mean it'd be nice if it was vaguely performant but um just on human time scales i don't need this to be super optimized um so i think i'm okay with this for now uh we're probably gonna want to have some notion of a register or of a multi-qubit system qubits something like that okay basis one basis two um, can be done. Uh, what other qubit tests do we want to run? Um, let's see here. Uh, we want to be able to rotate a qubit. We want to be able to Probably other stuff we're gonna do with qubits, but I can't think what it is right now. So for now, let's just implement this pubstruct qubit. Um, and it will be, it will have a state, which will be a unit vector. And then we will impl qubit. Oh, by the way, we should derive some things about it. That if the compiler is, and uh, we will say from vector. I guess I can just say new. I can just say new. New is fine. It's obviously from a vector. Um. So pub function new. basis zero is gonna return that and pub function basis one is gonna return that. Okay. And we're being yelled at because it doesn't implement default. equal, that's also fine. Okay. We expect our test to pass.
Okay. Uh, and what's going on? Oh, I did a bad thing. Um, this needs to be out here. And this needs to be up here somewhere. Okay. Uh, did I just get you out of the way? Formatting, formatting, formatting. have a basic qubit. All right. Um, so the next thing that we're going to want to do is implement gates. So let's do that in a new file. Open gate. And test mod. Gate. Initializes. Um, okay. And here we want so the quantum gate. I think we want unitary gates and like one qubit gates and two qubit gates, which should cover all of our use cases, I think. Um, quantum gates. Zero, zero, basis zero, but basis one. Um, let mixed state. Be basis zero plus basis one. And we'll, we'll, we'll have it normalize this. So I want to um, have a new test in here. Let's test qubit mixes. And we'll say mixed state is So this is going to be a mixed state where it shows up. The square root of a quarter squared is just a quarter. So it shows up as zero a quarter of the time and one three quarters of the time.
and then we can check that. the mixed state is close to mixed state minus um, length norm. Oh, my qubit. Okay. My qubit needs a norm. Okay. We'll give it a norm function also. All right. So we're just doing some useful algebra, or we're setting ourselves up to be able to do some useful algebra here. We'd like to be able to add quantum states together and have them get normalized and uh, become a mixed state, basically a superposition. Um, and that's going to require us to be able to multiply them also. Um, and then we also want to be able to norm them because they're just vectors under the hood. Um, and this is definitely not going to equal one zero. It's going to equal um, 0 0.25 square root and um, 0 0.75. And I'm actually going to update these to just be just not going to multiply that by anything. And we're going to multiply this by three. And it should work out. It should normalize for us. Okay. Um, okay. And what's the issue here? Oh, these have to be complex numbers. Um, a lot of clunky type stuff going on in here that we could probably clean up a little bit. Um, okay, so let's implement this. Um, and some of these are just going to be traits. So impl zero for qubit seems good. Impl one for qubit seems good. No, I don't want one. Um, Impl, I want, what do I want? I want to impl add for qubit. I want to impl mult for qubit mul. Um, and I want to um, but mole I want I want scalar multiplication. Um, which is And then what to do? What to do? Okay, can't add unit vectors, sure. Um but what we're going to do is dot vector. Can I just do that? No. Um, let's see here. Unit vector two um, new normalize. And um, I just need this to be a vector. How to get that? Hmm. Algebra uh, unit vector. 
character. unit back there. Okay. Let's see what we got. Cry from. From. Can I just do from or into or something? Um, let's see here. Into vector two. Okay, type annotation needed. And we'll say let resultant vector two be this complex. Self dot state is a unit vector. I understand that I cannot do that. a good way to do this. Surely, surely, surely. What if I just do this? We get nothing. This isn't right, is it? Very surprising. Um, Looking to see if there's anything 
good in the documentation for a unit. Cast? No. Into inner, there we go. Jeez, to inner. Uh, okay, that's better. Small qubit for F thirty two and output a qubit. And then this will be a qubit. Interesting. So this actually isn't going to work because the result of doing three times three times a qubit is just the same qubit. Um, So maybe we don't add these now that I did all that work. Let's not do that. And let's just say qubit um, let's see here, basis zero. Just say qubit dot mix. And then we'll do basis three. Basis zero, basis one, uh, one, three. So idea then would be you give it two, qubits and it mixes them with the appropriate coefficients. Um, tremendously love this either also not the nicest API I've ever seen but I can't think of a much better one so maybe it's fine. Um, okay. So we no longer have addition, so we won't implement that. And we'll just say pub function mix. Um, left 
hand side is a self, right hand side is a self, um, left hand side coefficient or weight is an F32, right hand side Uh, it actually shouldn't be an F32, though. It should be a complex number. Let's just do it with F32s for now. F32, F32, and then this becomes LHS coefficient is the square root of this. And And then LHS coefficient times that and RHS coefficient. Um, normalize and dot into. To multiply an F32 by a matrix of complex not really. Okay, it's a little clunky. Complex one times this. And complex one times this. What, you can't multiply a complex number by a complex matrix? I'm confused. Really? I for sure should be able to do that. I'm confused. Um, okay, am I employing this myself? Let's say rename this and call it an algebra traits. Sure. Uh, and let's test. So we would expect test can multiply complex numbers by complex vectors. Um, Make this three plus two i, and then we'll expect this to be close to three, this to be close to two. 
do this to be close to three, this to be close to two. Uh, why not make Y something else just to improve the test? Three, four, that's right. Okay, doesn't like multiplication. Let's see if we can impl null. What is it, left-hand side, right-hand side? Um, no, right-hand side, left-hand side. So this should be a vector two. of complex numbers or a complex number. And indeed, this is what I want. Complex vector two or complex of 32. I just do arbitrary types here. Ah, let's just do F32. Um, multiply vector. and F32. Okay. Only traits defined in the current crate can be implemented for types defined outside of the crate. Okay, this is frustrating. I am quite surprised. That this isn't already implemented. Like, it seems like a super basic thing that you can use complex numbers as scalars in matrices. Very surprising. implementation. Yes, instead we will do our own trait. Um,
this either. I'm trying to think of the best. itself can be multiplied by complex numbers of type t so itself times a complex of t and then we'll implement complex mol and um, we will not need an output type anymore So we're going to implement complex mol f32 for vector 2 of a complex number. So now vector 2 of the complex number multiplied by complex. T say F thirty two will take itself and multiply. So now, um, instead of doing this as multiplication, we can do dot multiply by um, now we do v dot multiply by. Super tedious, not a big fan, but is what it is. This should be fine now. Uh, what's the problem here? It's ambiguous, sure. take a matrix and scale it and let's call this let's actually call this um, complex scale and we'll say wait what why is it okay with me calling dot mol here What 
is happening. So are you telling me that if I don't have all of this and I just call dot complex mall, it works? I believe you. So if I want to mix this, I get the vector first, and then I say this dot mall, and you stop yelling at me. Okay, so it's like a subset of the traits that I would expect are implemented, but fine. Um, okay, qubits, what don't we like about this? Um, hey, we don't have norm applied yet. Um, yeah, but okay, because there's not really. So let's let's instead just dot approx equals. Um, the big qubit. on the qubit. Um, function prox equals and that will be on self and the right hand side. Um, and it will just be self dot State dot into inner minus or just state dot into inner. We just need to norm all of this. So we know how to mix some states now. Um, all right, and let's take a look at the quantum gate. So we will import some stuff and we're gonna create a mixed state by saying, um, qubit mix basis one. Um, and let's apply the gate result and say um, result dot almost equals. just the identity. And then let's let Hadamard be quantum gate Hadamard um, and say let result equals Hadamard gate dot apply mixed state. Okay, and so the what is Hadamard, the Hadamard gate rotates um, it rotates the unit vector or the basis state into a superposition in a in a in a predictable way. So let's just grab the definition of that from um, from Wikipedia probably.
so this is the transformation matrix for it um, and let's see here it rotates zero into a superposition and one into a superposition um, see here assert that whoops we need an assert here assert that Hadamard gate applied to basis zero almost equals states yes of one one assert almost equals Assert that for basis one should equal the same thing. And let's apply it to a mixed state, and then we will assert something about that mixed state. Um, say result. And it'll equal something. And I'm not 100% sure what that is. But we'll think about it. Um, OK, so goal here is to be able to implement a quantum, a quantum gate, which is just going to take one qubit in and return a transformed qubit. And we want, there are a couple different quantum gates, so we want to be able to instantiate a arbitrary quantum gate. Identity gate B quantum gate identity. Um, and then we can just assert um, that those are approximately equal. Uh, so we want to be able to compare quantum gates themselves, and we want to be able to apply them um, and get the right things out, including being able to apply the Hadamard gate. Okay, so we'll get to implementing this in a moment. Um, I'm just going to run to the bathroom quickly first. Okay, and we're back. Um, okay, so let's implement quantum gate. 
Um, slightly annoying that it pull, puts the imports inside the tests, although I understand why it does. Um, okay, pubstruct quantum gate it will have matrix two in it. Let's derive some stuff about it. Not this, but this. Okay. And import quantum gate. Um, new should just take the matrix. Uh, new normalize. Is new normalize a thing? It is. So my quantum gates have to be unitary. They have to be unitary. So actually, this needs to be a unit matrix. Can I do this? Because our, our, our matrices need to not convert unitary vectors to non-unitary vectors, right? Non-unit vectors, I should say. Um, and that property in a matrix is called unitarity. Um, you can interpret it in reality as um, the quantum state can't, can't, has to always, you have to be able to find your particle or whatever somewhere. Uh, right, so you can't end up with more than 100% probability or less than 100% probability at the end of the day. So it's got to be unitary. Um, so we will actually do a new normalize. And we will do identity. And can I not just do dot one here? That is what the Hadamard gate looks like, I believe. Let's check. Um, yes, that is what the Hadamard gate looks like. And then what else? all my functions. Oh, the proxy equals. Good. Interesting. Um, I guess we'll have a get state on qubit. Let's copy, so that's fine.
Cool. Let's cargo test. Let's see what we get. Some failures. Um, okay. Can multiply num complex numbers by complex vectors? Failed. One of the Hadamards failed. Okay, I knew one of the Hadam. Mm, not this one, though. So the Hadamard vector, the Hadamard matrix does, what does it take? One, two. Hadamard gate takes it to zero minus one. So this needs to be minus one. And then, and this one's gonna fail also. Funny thing where git bash loses its mind sometimes. So this is failing, but we kind of expect that, or we do expect that. Um, okay. Okay, so they're both totally real. So if they're both totally real, then we expect one of them to be, let's see here, we're rotating the state um, one quarter, three quarters. So presumably it's three quarters, one quarter now. Um, three quarters, one quarter. minus one quarter. Uh, let's see here, what am I doing wrong? This, is, this doesn't look like the square root of a quarter. The square root of a quarter is a half. Um, so we have a test already that, that does the mixing. This test runs fine. One, three, square root, square root, okay. And so then the Hadamard gate rotates, rotates our two vectors. It keeps them real if they started real. And I think this would be right. Um, this shouldn't need parentheses now. Result had our gate mixed state, and I did the same mix. 
the Y. It's not coming out. It should be a 90 degree rotation. I would think. my intuition because the matrix these are all one over root two this is what all of these are So this matrix this is a real matrix, so it takes real vectors to real vectors. rotate by 90 degrees and we can do the math Just do the math, right? So, um, square root of a third, square root of three, or square root of a quarter, square root of three quarters is going to get mapped by this to the square root of a quarter plus the square root of three quarters. Oh, okay. It totally doesn't work the way that I thought it did. Um, okay. This would be 0.25 f32 dot square root plus that. And this would be um, 0.75 f32 square root minus that. Nope, got that backwards. 2.5. 7.5 and why don't we like this because we got an extra thing okay any better there we go okay that's what it was I was thinking it was going to be a rotation by 90 degree like I was thinking about it as um, an anal analogous to a real rotation which it is but it does not do the same thing arithmetically that a real rotation does, which I guess shouldn't shock me. Um, okay, so how do our gates work? Everything going well there. Um, and then we just have our tests can multiply by complex numbers. We're getting 1.34. That seems really wrong. We instantiate a complex number. Oh, because these are unit vectors. They get normalized. Sure. Um, let normalizer be um, let's see here what's it going to be we're going to have to divide by the it's going to be the norm of V. Unnormed V. Let unnormed V be this. Unnormed V dot norm. Um, 
these need to get divided by the normalizer. And that should succeed. Okay. Cool, cool. And we're gonna just run all of our tests to make sure. Okay, test passing. Sick. Um, let's go ahead and commit this. and quantum gate implementations. All right. All right, all right, all right. So we are approaching the point where we can do what we want. Um, we need to be able to take measurements is the thing we need to be able to do. So let's test. Um, Qubit measures. And this is going to be probabilistic. So um, let's say let's let's see here assert equals um, qubit basis zero. Yeah, so anytime that we measure basis zero, we should get back zero. That's the defining property of the basis vector for zero and the same thing for one. Okay. And then a mixed state um, ought to give us back one or zero. And Um, I'm just trying to think how best to test the probabilities here. That's not really a good way. So we'll stick with this for now, but the probabilities we know will be one quarter and three quarters. Um, so let's use brand. Prelude. And prelude everything. And we will put the function measure. Um, U size. Interesting. It's U size with two values. We really could just return a pool, but let's not. Let's return a U8 will be a one or a zero. Um, get a random number. We will say that the probability of zero is um, probability of zero should be x squared. that the probability of one is going to be the opposite of that. And I'm pretty sure the, the way that this works now is like this. Okay. And then if the random number is less than the probability of zero, we return. Um, Probability of zero. It's got to be normed. Dot norm. It's the norm squared. Dot. Magnitude? No. Absolute value.
we expect our test to pass. All right, so what we have here is a qubit that can be, that when it is um, in one of its zero, in one of its basis states, it always returns zero or one, but if it's in a mixed state, it could return either, and it does so with a certain probability. Okay. So we are ready to demonstrate the interference of measurement. Um, and this is kind of the payoff that I was hoping to get to today. Um, so the idea here, and I'll bring it up in the, in the book that I got it from. Oh, and of course it. Um, so the idea here is that it depends in quantum mechanics, like people have heard about this, right? If you do the double split experiment or if you do Schrodinger's cat, it depends, Schrodinger's cat is the best example, right? You put a cat in a box, it's got a quantum tra radioactive trigger that puts the cat in a superposition of being alive and dead with probability one half. Um, and then if you open the box, you measure the cat to either be alive or dead. Um, if you close the box and then reopen it, the cat will still be alive or dead. Um, if you take a slightly less morbid example and you take like a particle that's in um, it's the Stern-Gerlach experiment, if you take a particle that's spin up and you uh, and you put it in a superposition of, sorry, if you put it in a superposition of being up and down, 50-50, you measure it, you're gonna find out that it's either up or down 50% of the time, either one. Um, if you measure it uh, along the x-axis, sorry, if you put it in spin up, let's say, and you measure it along the x-axis, uh, you will get 50-50 results if you, if you then measure it. Uh, and if you measure it again, you'll get whatever result you got before. But if you put it in the up uh, direction and then you don't, I'm really not saying this well. You put it in the up direction, you measure it in the x direction, you get 50-50 results in the x direction. If you measure it in the uh, uh, z direction again, you will get 50-50 um, because measuring it in the x direction has caused it to essentially go through a Hadamard gate and um, become in a superposition of up and down because it's definitely, you know, left. Um, if you just, if you didn't measure it though, it would still have the superposition, it would still be definitely in the up state. I'm still not quite articulating that, that right. It, it's actually clearer in the quantum circuit. So I should just use that example rather than bringing in the stern gerlach experiment, which has one more step in it that I'm not um, quite getting right. Uh, so the idea here is that if you take a basis state like zero, zero, if you measure it, you always get zero. You put it through a Hadamard gate, it now is rotated into being into a, a perfect superposition of zero and one. If you measure it, you will get 50, 50, zero, or one. If you then, now it's in state zero with 50% or one with 50%. Whichever one it is, if you measure it again, you will get the same one. So at the end, it's it's 50-50. If you instead um, take zero, put it into the Hadamard gate, uh, don't measure it, and then put it through a Hadamard gate again, you will just get back the same state you started with. And so it will definitely still be a zero state. Um, and this is this is the math that it, that it works through. So the point is, you're doing the same thing in either case. You're putting it through two Hadamard gates. The only difference in what you're doing is you're measuring the value in the middle in the, in the top example, and you're not measuring the value in the middle in the bottom example. And this seems spooky, right? Why, why should it matter if I measured the value? Uh, why should that give me different results? And the answer, uh, which we'll see in a moment, is because when you measure it, you change its quantum state. 
um, and so you change its vector. And I'm, it's occurring to me now that we didn't actually model that. Um, so that was good to notice. Um, in our, hey, it's our soup. This is an interesting project. Ah, thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. Um, I, I love this stuff. I'm, I'm super into it. Um, so at the moment I'm struggling to articulate what I mean, but, um, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm super into it. So, okay. So we didn't do one thing. Um, we didn't in our measurements, we needed to update the state as well. So after each of these, um, we need to get a resulting qubit out of this. So, like it's kind of interesting actually because it mutates. The whole point is that when we measure it, it mutates it, which means we need a mutable reference to this. Like it's actually interesting because Rust is gonna maybe have some either helpful or hurtful. Um, things to like interactions with this. Um, so let's, let's do it as um, basis zero measurement um, basis new new qubit basis zero qubit. Um, and we'll do the same thing with basis one. Okay. Um, and it's unhappy with me because that's not what the function does, but that's fine. Um, okay, and then this will be uh, mixed state measurement and mixed state um, new mixed state qubit. Um, and we'll assert that it's either zero or one. And we will assert that um, new mixed state qubit almost is in one of the basis states. So this is the other thing that I didn't say. When you measure a qubit um, with respect to some basis, which for our purposes is always gonna be zero or one, then um, even if it was in a mixed state, it collapses into of one of the basis states. So uh, if you measure zero, then it collapses into the zero basis state. And if you measure one, then it collapses into the one basis state. Um, and if you wanna know why it does that, there are a couple of different perspectives. Um, there is the, what's called the shut up and calculate or Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, which says uh, that's just what it does. Like believe that as a postulate of quantum mechanics. There is another interpretation. Well, there are a lot of interpretations. Um, the one I am fond of, and I'm super influenced by Sean Carroll here, who's a physicist, um, but I like the many worlds interpretation, um, which just, which essentially says, um, you can't look at the system, the subsystem as, as a subsystem you have to include the fact that when you're measuring, um, what, what you're doing when you're measuring is interacting the system, the quantum computer in this case, with its environment, like you're poking at it or you're putting it through a magnetic field or something. And when you do that, it becomes entangled with the state of the environment. And when it becomes entangled with the state of your environment, you can work through the math and what happens is you end up with uh, you end up with a, a resulting universal state, uh, the state of the world, so to speak, 
that branches and either you're on the one where you measured one and it's in the it's in the state it's in the basis state for one or you're on the branch where you measured zero and it's in the basis state of zero um and it seems like this kind of crazy thing that sort of the universe literally branches out um but when you work through the math it's actually like super obvious to me that it's the the, the better way to think about it um and so we need to update our function to return the new um the new vector so when we measure we expect to get a measurement um which let's actually call this a measurement and a self um and then we're going to return uh, basis zero or basis one. Okay. And I'm just going to say type measurement is for our purposes always a U8. It's a zero or a one. All right. Um, and what did I, what did I do here? Oh, um, I always forget that you need parens around your tuples. I think in Python, that's not true, I wanna say. In some language that I've used, that's not true. And they feel redundant here to me. Um, okay. Let's cargo test again. Nice. And Hadamard gates. Okay, we applied all our Hadamard gates. Okay, so we want to demonstrate that interference or demonstrate the measurement, really. Um, test measurement interference. And so we're going to put together exactly those quantum circuits. Um, so. Dude, if GitHub does this correctly, it's gonna be Huh. Really interesting. Okay. So GitHub is saying take a Hadamard gate. Um Take your 50-50 mix. No, I don't want that. I don't care about the mixed state. Why are we talking about a mixed state? Um, I want to, I don't care about this either. Okay, let's just emulate those same circuits. So this is going to be a um, circuit with measurement in the middle um, and it's going to be something like zero Hadamard measure uh, Hadamard and that's going to be we'll call this um, this is going to yield a 50-50. It's actually just going to yield the state. Um, oh yeah, 50. It's going to yield the state 0 with 50% and it's going to yield the state 1 with 50%. Um, and so we'll take our basis state of 0. We will apply the Hadamard to it. Um, we will let's do this let's do this in a for loop actually all right i'm gonna get rid of all this this is all junky um what we're gonna do is let uh result count mm. what do i want to say Let count 
zeros. Could be zero. Let count ones. Could be one. And then we will say, and Hadamard gate we can keep. Basis zero we can keep. Um, but, and the result of applying it, we can keep also. So, had a marded zero, we'll call it. Um, and then let's do a for loop. And we will measure um, after measurement. And we'll say, let's bump the counts appropriately. Um, and Let's also assert that our um, that our resulting state is how to mark it, or no, after measurement um, should either be the basis zero. Um, or it should be the basis one. What's the problem here? Expected one argument found two. There. Okay, so after we after we measure it, it should definitely be in one of the two states. Um, and then once we're done with that, we will assert that we're within a reasonable margin of 50-50. Um, and then we want to pass the result um, back through a Hadamard gate. And so I'm actually going to take all of these and move them later. Um, say second measurement. And we'll say let second measurement. Um, and after second measurement, B applied there. And then we'll add things up. So we're checking that after. So it's, it's this case, right? We start with the basis factor. We had a mart it to get to a 50 50 state. We measure it. We had a mart it again. We measure it and we look at the probabilities there. And what we expect, well, intuitively what you would expect is that you would get back, you would get zero back. But the measurement turns out to have an impact and the reason the measurement has an impact is because here we end up with a 50-50 case of basis zero or basis one, which then gets put through 50-50 through Hadamard is gonna be um, a 50-50 case of uh, one of two 50-50 cases, which are going to average out to be uh, another 50-50 case. Whereas our second test, which we'll do in a moment, we don't measure it in between. And so we go from zero to Hadamard to Hadamard, which gets us back to zero. There's no measurement in between um, that messes things up. So let's do that case. And in that case, it's actually really easy. We take, um, we just take, let double Hadamarded 
zero. Um, be that. And then we can assert that no matter what, um, double had a marted, marted zero dot measure um, dot one is qubit basis zero. Um, circuit with without measurement in the middle is do 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 do. Yep, I agree with that. And we double hadamard it and we assert. Okay. And why are we getting yelled at? Um, we should assert that it's always zero. Um, expected qubit. Oh. Okay. And I mean, I guess we can say, let's see here. Um, let measurement after measurement do that. And we expect the measurement to be zero. And we expect the final state to be um, the basis zero. Let's test that. And it passed. Passed on the first try. OK, so there, there we are. This is, this is the mechanism for how measurement interferes with quantum results. Um, in the case where we measure in the middle, we can take a, a totally in the superposition of one and zero state, which is what happens when you take a, a basis state and you put it through Hadamard. We can measure it. At that point, something probabilistic is already going on. We have to go and like sample and count up. Um, we would have to go in and count up how, how often it measured to zero or measured to one. But the result, the result is that we now have two different possibilities already. It can either be in a basis state zero or a basis state one. We then had a mard that again, and we get we, we now get either a had a marded zero or a had a marded one. And when you measure those, what do you get? Well, you get 50-50. Uh, zero and one for both, and 50, 50, zero, one, 50, 50, zero, one, you add those together, you're still getting 50, 50, zero, one. Versus if you have the circuit without the measurement in the middle, then you take a zero, you had a mart it into a mixed state, you had a mart it again, it goes back to the zero state, and then you measure it, well, you've just got the zero state and you're measuring it, so you're always going to get zero back. Um, and indeed, we see that our test does that, and and it's really not mystical, right? It's just it's a, a feature of how this measurement function works, right? It not only um, computes a probability of being in either of the basis vectors when you measure it, it also returns the um, it, it it changes the state of your system into the corresponding basis vector. Um, and that's that's like very generalizable across all quantum mechanics. This is in general how, how quantum mechanics um, does things. So the stern lock experiment is very similar. Um, the cat is some really, like Schrodinger's cat is some really complex quantum system, but, the, but fundamentally it has a basis vector uh, that corresponds to being alive or dead, and when you measure it, you either get alive or dead, and the cat cat's basis vector is going to correspond to um, that zero or one at, at that time. So this is this is very general. Um, cool. I'm going to wrap up there um, for now. Got to uh, got to the goal. Um, uh, show that, let's see here, implement measurement and show that 
interference happens. Um, and yeah, I'm pretty pretty pleased that in in a little over two hours we got there. Um, and we're gonna start working towards Shor's algorithm next time. Um, which is going to take some number theory at the beginning. Um, so that, uh, that should be interesting. That should be kind of cool. Um, hope everybody is doing well, and I'll catch you in the next one, uh, hopefully tomorrow. All right, take care.